Hey everyone, sorry for the setup today. Uh, my tripod thing broke and so everything is just very precariously placed on a bunch of books and you can see the mic in the screen. But I had to film this today. I have been up most of the night just flooded with thoughts and it's just honestly bursting out of me. I don't think I've been so excited to make a video in a long, long time. So I'm making this video to clarify a lot of things that I said in my last video, which I thought were going to be clear. I mean, I was very vague, but I was intentionally vague because I was trying to be a little bit diplomatic, I guess. But in this video, I'm going to be very, very explicit because somehow, even though I was very clear to say that the transition will likely not be nonviolent, people thought, hey, are you saying that all revolutionary violence is bad? Are you saying that all revolutions that have ever happened are just terrible and bad? Hey, are you saying that men are inherently violent and aggressive and women are just inherently nurturing and compassionate? Are you saying there are no women revolutionaries? Is that what you're saying, Mexi? No, that's not what I said and it's not what I was trying to say. So stay tuned later. I'm going to talk about the difference between capital R revolution and regular R revolution. And I actually think that regular R revolution is imminent. I actually do. And I don't think it's going to be nonviolent necessarily. And I don't think it's going to be patriarchal. So stay tuned for that. But first, I'm going to start with patriarchy. Marine and I made a podcast called Could Capitalism Exist Without Patriarchy, which I invite you to listen to. But in it, we talk about how capitalism, although it exacerbates patriarchy, patriarchy, as we all know, very clearly far outdates capitalism. And we talk about how capitalism is merely the logical extension of thousands and thousands of years of patriarchy and of patriarchal modes of governance, but also patriarchal modes, you know, patriarchal values, patriarchal ways of speaking and thinking and engaging with one another. Patriarchy as a system valorizes toxically masculine ways of interaction, of posturing, of competition, of dominance, of bending people to your will and of might is right mentality. Patriarchy is steeped in othering, and othering at its core is the ego's form of defense. It's, I feel insecure about my manhood or my relative position of power and feeling like I might lose that, and so I am going to other you. Because othering is defining the other in order to define the self, right? So if I'm othering you as less than, then I am simultaneously defining myself as better than. And it works the same way with racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, fatphobia, etc., the whole gambit that very unfortunately do rear their ugly heads in leftist spaces. I'm going to talk about science and materialism later on, but Saeed's Orientalism provides a great framework for understanding how white man's burden and patriarchal Eurocentric visions of progress, rationality, etc. have been baked into the ways that we understand our society as subjects of a colonial, patriarchal, capitalist settler state. So we've all been colonized with these mindsets. They exist within us and different people in the society have been socialized differently to think and act and engage with other people in different ways for different reasons. This does not mean that there's anything inherent in those people that makes them act or behave in certain ways over others. This is about our systemic socialization under patriarchy and capitalism. Many non-men have reached out to me and thanked me sincerely for saying all of this because they largely agree with me, but they wouldn't dare speak up and say anything in male-dominated leftist spaces or even in spaces that include women and people of color, but where it's understood that there's a certain bravado required. I've had men, cis men, so many cis men have come to me and said, thank you so much for what you have said, because I feel the same way, but I wouldn't dare bring this up with my friends, my leftist friends, or in my leftist space or whatnot. And, you know, having grown up socialized a woman, I mean, I definitely know what it's like when you're in a space and, you know, all the dudes are making 
horrible, sexist, racist, violent jokes, and you want to be the cool girl, right? You don't want to be the girl that's outcasted. So you know, and then they'll look at you and say something like, "Oh, gee, are you offended? Does that does that offend you, or does that、uh, hurt your weak sensibilities?" And you have to just. Sit there and then join the posturing and be like, no, 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 I don't. I'm fine with that. I'm totally cool with that. Yeah, mass murder, cool. Yeah, let's keep talking about it. Yeah, I'm totally fine. I'm a cool girl. I'm not saying everyone in leftist spaces or everyone who's into capital R revolution is being toxically masculine, but I am saying that we've created spaces, unconsciously or not, where people are forced to be the metaphorical cool girl, which typically means accepting capital R revolution. As the only rational way forward, and often indulging people in jokes or serious talk about lining everyone up who has profited off the system against the wall. There's a definite revolutionary bravado in many of these spaces that seems to valorize spectacularized violence more than more femme-coded activities of building relationship and trust. And here I want to bring up a very telling example from Catherine, my great comrade, who has an amazing. YouTube channel, go check out Catherine. But she was telling me about how she went to this socialist conference, and the very first day was a feminist day, I suppose. It was for non-men only, and in that day, the conversations were beautiful. People were listening to each other with deep empathy and humility, and responding with respect. And people were actually coming together and thinking of productive things to do and ways forward. It was all great. The next two days were opened up to men, and very predictably, perhaps, but also shockingly, like shocking and telling, is that then it just devolved into the MLs yelling at the trots and the trots yelling at the anarchists and everyone trying to prove who was right and who was wrong, and everything became completely unproductive. Even though you know women were there, non-men were there, people of color were there, the conversations became dominated by white cis men. And this was the result, and I I think that's very telling. And this is not to say that there's something inherent in cis white men. People are thinking that I'm saying a white male bad, 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 bad. No, there's nothing inherent. Most of my best comrades are the most fiercely compassionate, empathetic, humble, deeply humble. Cis white dudes, right? Like, there's there's nothing inherent in a person that would make them behave this way. But people have been socialized in certain ways, and we need to actually unlearn this stuff. There's so much that we have to consciously, consciously unlearn if we're going to come into these spaces and work together. To build a better future. Another great example that I have is that absolutely zero women have come to me and said, "Hey, your characterization of capital R revolution as patriarchal is offensive to me as a revolutionary woman." I did have non-men, non-binary people say that、um, you know the the language I was using, like phallic and birthing, was not great because it erases their experience, and I I completely apologize for that. I don't want this to be a, a binary thing. By and large, it's been nearly a hundred percent white men who have come to me and said, "How dare you frame this capital R revolution as patriarchal? Don't you know that there were women revolutionaries? Did you ever think of that?" <laughs> hadn't crossed my mind. Thank you, sir. And we're gonna get more into this later. But I mean, first of all, I think we're very much past the point of. Oh well, if there's women participating, then it can't possibly be patriarchal. If we have a woman president, well, we're basically living in a matriarchy. If there are people of color participating, then it can't possibly be white supremacist or colonial or Eurocentric. But my biggest issue was that most of these cis men typically. Would come at me not from a position of humility and wonder and hey, I'm curious. Why do you think that this framing is patriarchal? I'd like to learn more and let's have a, a, an open dialogue about this. It's listen, you. Here's all the reasons that you're wrong and you need to be quiet. You need to just shut up now. I have many friends who are non-men who are Marxist-Leninist or Trots or whatever, and they may disagree with me, but they would never come at me. 
with that kind of a posturing. They would never do that. That is such a violent way of speaking to another human and of engaging with them. And from that standpoint, you're not open to learning. This isn't just an intellectual exercise. All of these systems exist within us and they are perpetuated through us. I am not perfect either. I have internalized patriarchal norms and capitalist norms and settler colonial norms. Sometimes I get real pissed and I go off, but we have to at least try to do better. We all have so much conscious unlearning to do if we're going to actually build a community together that's going to build a radically different world. And what I'm talking about with the power fantasies is the same. We have to examine deeply what it is within us that is yearning for that stuff, even jokingly, and how that might be just a perpetuation of the systems we have now. So I'll start with regular R revolution and how I see potentially things playing out in Canada or in the West more broadly. Regular R revolution is when there is a revolutionary rupture that isn't one giant overthrow of the central government and then a replacement of that government. It's a revolution that unfolds in stages and involves the coalescing of multiple smaller revolutionary activities and militant mass strikes and disruptions that on their own might not be considered revolutionary at all. In my last video, I had people saying, you know, the climate strike or mass protests or food not bombs, these are not revolutionary movements, right? Or people critiquing the yellow vest in France, well, that's not a revolutionary movement. It didn't, didn't th overthrow capitalism, did it? Well, no shit it didn't. No shit these aren't going to overthrow capitalism. But the deepening environmental crisis, the austerity crisis, crushing people, making life unlivable, automation increasing, putting people out of work. I mean, there are going to be so many resistance movements and people getting fed up and that's all of that together, coupled with the fact that capitalism is eating itself, I think will coalesce to force a revolutionary change. In Canada, for example, it's getting far too expensive for people to actually make a living in the cities, and so the big cities, and so uh, millennials and Zoomers are increasingly moving out into the countryside. This is significant because currently most leftists and left of center people, social democrats, etc., are concentrated in the cities. As well, depending on how bad things get and how the discourse shifts, UBI could potentially be on the horizon. And people are also saying that, okay, well, if we all have UBI, then that will make it easier for people to move out a bit away from the city and start to build communities that will be a bit more self-sufficient. I mean, millennials already think that they will die before they retire, or they're not even planning for retirement. They're planning to join a commune when they get of age to retire, right? And I have lots of friends who are in rural Ontario where people are actually self-organizing a lot of things just out of necessity, but they happen to be quite reactionary, not my friends personally, but the rural areas tend to be a lot more conservative, a lot more libertarian, a lot more fascist. So yeah, what, what what's that gonna mean for our organizing going forward? How are we gonna organize in these rural areas? We should be focusing on that, especially if we can't actually make our livings in the city anymore. And also because food security is going to be a very pressing issue in the coming climate crisis. And most of the food that we get is coming from the, the countryside that's getting increasingly more fascist. So what are we doing about that? This will make urban food security and re the land that much more important in cities as well for people who do stay. So this will all create opportunities and challenges. It'll create opportunities to potentially start building communities that are more self-reliant and are able to meet people needs outside of the state and outside of capital. And it also presents a number of challenges in terms of, okay, well, how do we reckon with the fact that all of this land that we might be building community on is stolen land? How do we decolonize? The environmental crisis is also making people riot and just get a lot more militant. And I think that we will see a ramping up of blockades and just people doing whatever possible to make these industries unprofitable. Workers are already seizing the means of their own workplaces and turning them into renewable energy factories. This is awesome and this will contribute to our ability to meet people's needs 
outside of the state and outside of capital. Some people are saying also, you know, the rich, once they automate production, they don't necessarily need consumers even. They can just use the robots to create whatever they want. They can just harvest natural resources and create whatever wealth they want. They don't even really need workers. So maybe our clash with the capitalists and the state will look different than it has in the past. Maybe by the time we do clash with the state, it will be much weaker. And maybe actually people in the military or the police will look around and say, hey, everyone has come together and has done a pretty good job building this new society that looks a lot better than what the state and capital is offering. So maybe I refuse to shoot unarmed civilians who have done nothing wrong. Maybe not, probably not. We're probably like, how many times do I have to repeat in my video that things will likely not be nonviolent? When I say defense, community defense, against a militaristic state, I don't see how people thought that I was saying that this would be passive and nonviolent and that we shouldn't actually defend ourselves from being killed. But where is our focus? Is it on consciously building what we want while striking and disrupting and defending what we're co-creating together? Or is it on a singular violent upheaval? Look, people in the West are relatively comfortable. Nonviolence is a privilege, but it's a privilege most people here have enjoyed their entire lives. But I teach an environmental studies class, and believe me, everyone from across the political spectrum sees the writing on the wall. They know this way of life is coming to an end, and they are eager to plan and build what comes next. We don't actually have to rehabilitate images of Stalin or even Lenin to get people on board. All we have to do is convince them that change is coming and let's get out ahead of this and build the world that we want to take care of us all. It will be way easier to get people here excited and energized about building the new than it will by telling them, yeah, come with us and get organized into a militia with the ultimate goal of violently usurping the state. The state that happens to be directly adjacent to the most powerful military the world has ever seen. I'm sorry, but the days of a scrappy vanguard taking their muskets into battle are over. So that's a regular R revolution in my opinion. And to me, I think that's very plausible in the coming decades. And I think it's actually very desirable, more desirable to me than a capital R revolution, because we're actually building the world that we want to live in and then defending that world. We'll be building a world that is not patriarchal, hopefully, and that focuses on restorative instead of carceral justice from the get-go. I mean, in, in another podcast that we had Ash on the podcast, I actually said that, you know, people always say you can imagine the end of the world before you can imagine the end of capitalism, or Mark Fisher said that, or I, a lot of people have said that. But I actually, I can imagine, I can imagine the end of the world and I can imagine the end of capitalism before the end of patriarchy. I think it's a very, very important. So I'm gonna talk now about capital R revolution and how this framing of social change can remain patriarchal. Now, please wait, people are gonna get their backs up a lot when I start talking about this. So please wait to hear the subsequent paragraph after I explain because I am not throwing anyone under the bus. I am in fact celebrating them. This is what I avoided saying last time. <laughs> so I guess I'll be more explicit about it now. And you wanna know why I avoided saying it? Because I'm deeply uncomfortable and we've created a situation where people can't talk about this without being decried as not a real leftist and just a baby and an idealist and a liberal. So a capital R revolution to me is one where there is a vanguard party that organizes the masses potentially to meet people's needs in the here and now, but very often we'll decry that most things are not revolutionary and not the main goal. The main goal is overthrowing the government. So this party organizes the workers to overthrow the government and then sets themselves up in that government, that seat of power. But, you know, whatever, it's, it's democratic because everyone is participating all the way down. And then they subsequently centralize, create, you know, central planning 
and maintain a police and military force in order to crush dissidents and revisionists lest they rise up and destroy the revolution. Now hold on, am I throwing every revolution that went down like this under the bus? What about Cuba? I thought you loved Cuba and you went there all the time and you loved Che. I thought you loved Thomas Sankara. Yes, and I mean, yes, but no, I'm not throwing anyone or any of these revolutions under the bus. These were all miraculous feats of their time. People were able to come together and do this under the material conditions of their time, and it wasn't just one authoritarian leader that was forcing everyone to do everything. There were masses of people behind these things, and they achieved a lot of great stuff for people, working people, and women participated, and sub subsequently they often saw their rights and standing rise as well. Wonderful. I am not throwing anyone under the bus who has earnestly engaged in revolutionary struggle. That is not the point of my videos on this. My point is to actually get us to dive deeper into these things and question some of the underlying assumptions. So I have never been convinced that this is the route to full communism. I have never been convinced that this is the route to smashing patriarchy. Indeed, I think patriarchy lives on and it is kind of patriarchal. And I'm not convinced, I've never been convinced that we would actually be taking on the US military head on, which is basically what we would have to do in the West. I absolutely love the work that Eyes Left is doing to actually reach out to active service members, active military members, and former members, and, you know, radicalize them and organize them. That is awesome. That is great work. And I really believe that we need to do the most anti-imperialist action that we can in order to give other countries some breathing room to potentially develop their alternative systems. That's very important. But this capital R revolution, that, that's not where I'm going to be putting my energy because my end goal is a decolonized, reciprocal, full communism. That's the goal that I'm marching towards. And to be honest, I've really just kind of taken the, the theory of it at face value and thought that everyone who is arguing for this capital R revolution is doing so in the good faith assumption that this is the only, this is a necessary transition phase between capitalism and full communism. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time with very principled MLs who I love and respect deeply, and I've asked them all about why they are convinced about this. I, I am, I am not convinced. I am yet to be convinced. And to be very frank, I think it would be better if some people would just admit that their end goal, their end goal is the centralized state with the socialist military and the socialist police and, and central planning, not as the transition phase between that and full communism, but as the final resting place. Framing the revolution this way makes it out to be yet another war game and a grab for power with the assumption that with the bad guys gone and the good guys in charge, everyone will be liberated. It requires a group of leaders with advanced ideological purity that, based on comments from my last video, has absolutely no time for indigenous wisdom or feminist theory or anything that isn't in line with the science of overthrowal and carceral punishment. And even if women obtain more rights and even take on more leadership roles, I don't see this necessarily as a major break from patriarchal modes of governance. And in that case, if you're thinking about a settler state like Canada, then you're basically throwing decolonization out the window and, you know, that, that's just not possible and that's not a goal for you. So, you know, if people were honest about that, then okay, we're fighting for different things. We don't want the same thing. And if that's your end goal, then it makes perfect sense that you're going to spend your time trying to 
create a critical mass and look into military training and whatever is needed to overthrow a government and install a new one and keep it there, have it there to perpetuate itself and not actually dissolve. I mean, our entire history is just marked by men playing war games, so you will have to excuse me if I don't feel excited and hopeful and, you know, thrilled about a bunch of, <laughs> I mean, I, I can't even say it's just young men who are doing this, but you know what I'm saying, like a bunch of dudes with guns saying, hey, join me, we're going to liberate you. And if you do honestly think that this is the most advanced stage that's gonna get us the closest to full communism and that it will eventually happen, that's fine. I'm not convinced. I respect that you think that and I don't know that you're wrong. You might be absolutely right. But what I'm asking for is the humility for you to say that you also don't know that you're necessarily going to be right about that, right? We're all making educated guesses. This is what I mean about, you know, yes, we have a lot of theories from the past, but they're theories, and we haven't seen the result. And I think that any form of society that doesn't get rid of othering and, and question people's need to other and where that comes from and dominance, and a society that doesn't actually foster just from the, the smallest, most fractal level, radically different, compassionate ways of engaging with one another and building community, I don't think that's going to bring really radical change to the way that we live together. I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to be building what it is that I want to see, and I'm going to be doing that by listening to people who don't look like me, who don't live like me, and figuring out how we can go forward together in, in an anti-oppressive way. Because look, like militancy and violence are not inherently male, and the opposite inherently female. But if non-men and indigenous people are uncomfortable with the actions that you're organizing, then you should probably listen to them and find out why and find out how you can maybe try to make your organizing and your strategizing more inclusive and more welcoming to people instead of just making fun of them and dismissing them and saying, oh, we don't have time for this shit. And this is another thing, you know, people who are like, oh, well, my organization has all these women and all these people of color. Sure, but are you creating a space where all women and all people of color and all mar marginalized folks can come to the table and express whatever opinions they want? Or are you only creating seats at the table for women and people of color and whatever who buy your dogma and who would not speak up and say anything to contradict it? Is there room at your table for women or people of color or whoever who are saying things similar to what I'm saying? Or would you laugh them and humiliate and shame them out of the room? So here I wanna get into reciprocity, indigenous leadership, and the idea of needing to reduce our material throughput and charges of primitivism. So I'm gonna actually start with analyzing science and materialism first. Materialism is analyzing the material conditions of whatever time you're talking about and how those conditions lead to social behavior and social change, how they drive social change. Materialist analysis is what I do for a living, <laughs> which is why I said historical materialism can be predictive in certain cases, but not always if we haven't seen the result that we're trying to achieve. Materialism is not whatever certain theorists said about the material conditions of their time a hundred years ago. Somehow the word materialism has gotten attached to whatever Lenin said or whatever Stalin said or whatever whoever said. And that's materialism, and that's scientific. And going back to the Orientalism slide, the scientific has historically been used as a tool of colonialism and as a tool of patriarchy and white supremacy. Appeals to science were historically appeals to authority and 
patriarchal and white supremacist authority as Haraway talks about in her book. So am I against science? No, I am out here all the time talking about the importance of climate science, etc. It's just that when the social sciences or the humanities or whatever feel the need to make these grand appeals to science, objectivist science, these are just thinly veiled appeals to authority and rationality. And the rational has always been coded as masculine as well. The rational and the scientific has always been in contrast to the pseudoscientific and the emotional and the spiritual crap of women and indigenous people and people from other cultures. So, you know, I'm sorry, but none of you are doing science more than I am doing science. And coming out and telling people you know, what I'm doing is science, what you're doing is not science, and we all trust science, right? You'd have to be deaf to go against science, so therefore my position is superior. It honestly makes my head spin, like what are you talking about? Like the patriarchal, toxically masculine way of interacting with things like this is to never admit that you're wrong or you might be wrong, never admit your mistakes, never admit your weakness like that. No, no, I am science man and you are emotional ridiculous woman. And I think honestly this is why a lot of cis men have come to me and said thank you for saying this because I feel so uncomfortable trying to talk about these things in these spaces because all of these patriarchal undertones are just baked right in, right? Like, you don't want to be the person saying these things that are coded as feminine and emotional and idealist and not scientific and not materialist. And again, going back to this dichotomy, in this system, Eurocentric visions of technology and progress and this linear vision of progress goes hand in hand with white man's burden. And this goes hand in hand with discounting complex, developed, intentional, indigenous governance systems and land management as backwards and primitive and useless. I mean, let's face it, all of our leftist theory is Eurocentric because it was written by Europeans who were living under capitalism. Even if you take the position that colonialism and capitalism were good, actually, because they advanced the material conditions, which is the necessary precondition for socialism, which, first of all, yikes, how can you think that that is not Eurocentric when there were several, several indigenous nations that were already living in governance systems that more closely resemble socialism or anarchism before we came in and stomped them out? Even if you think conditions are better to live in today or in our capital society than they were in indigenous nations back then, can you not still see the incredible importance of challenging Eurocentric and linear visions of progress and development, especially since all of that progress and development has led us to the catastrophe that we're in today? As I said, technology and living in reciprocity with nature are not incommensurable, but technology in service of reciprocity is far different than technology in service of production and progress. Replacing one linear, unsustainable system, i.e. capitalism, with yet another linear system based on a linear Eurocentric vision of progress is not going to lead to a sustainable post-scarcity future. The opposite of that linear system would be a circle. <laughs> circular economies, circular ways of living, reciprocity. If everyone were to live as we live in the West, we would need at least six Earths centralizing everything and creating a centralized economy based on need, yeah, that's gonna help. But if we're not radically reevaluating what it is that we mean by need in the West, I do not see that number, that number of Earths dropping to just one Earth or less than one Earth, frankly. And I feel like a lot of people's aversion to the idea of needing to reduce our material output is also rooted in the fact that we've been colonized by capitalism. As Ash and John on the Horror Vanguard said, sorry, sorry, hey guys, sorry to throw you under the bus also. 
But they said that everyone, everyone in the society is libidinally invested in the spoils of capitalism. We are all invested and we don't want to give it up. And that's why we're in the mess that we're in today, because people in the West don't want to give up anything about the way that they're living. Saying that we won't have to give up anything about the way that we're living now or radically, radically reimagine it is, I think, living in denial. And I think that posturing or that framing of the issue will not lead us to actually take the steps to do what is necessary to create a sustainable future in which everyone can flourish. And yes, we need Western science for this too. There's no going back. In Braiding Sweetgrass, she talks about this perfectly. And Elder Albert Marshall actually coined the term two-eyed seeing to talk about the weaving of indigenous knowledge and Western science in ways that don't prioritize one over the other and don't devalue one over the other. This is so important. And by the way, if you think that indigenous knowledge and land management have nothing to teach us for sustainability going forward, you have a lot of reading to do in the fields of conservation biology and climate science. And so I, I invite everyone to read more broadly, read post-colonial theory, read indigenous theory, read feminist theory, get in touch with all of this stuff because we can't just have another dry, you know, militaristic overthrowal and expect that that's going to, to lead us to where we need to be, especially in the West. I don't see it happening. So I hope that what I've said here is more, more clear. And look, if the capital R revolution is popping off, you know that I will be there. But I will be majorly side-eyeing, especially when it comes to whatever comes next. Special thanks once again to Tristan from Step Back for editing this video. Check him out. Special thanks to my patrons now. I could not do this without you. Thank you for your support. Special shout out to Florian, Frank Suffel, Olga, Robert Choi, Jigglypuffer, Autumn K, and Jennifer Yu. Check out my podcast at veganvanguardpodcast.com. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in another video.